Well, good morning, First Free Church. It's good to be with you guys this morning. My name is Steve. I get the privilege of serving as one of the uh, pastors here at the church. And I wanted to wish you guys a happy Memorial Day um, weekend, I guess. Tomorrow's not, today's not the actual day. Tomorrow is. But I was, uh, I was pretty upset a couple days ago when I was thinking, man, I don't get to go camping over Memorial Day weekend. And then suddenly last night, As I was bundled up under two layers of comforters, had the heater on full blast, I had a change of heart. And so uh, I'm, I'm very glad that I didn't get to go camping this, uh, this weekend. And so if you're joining us online, welcome. If you're joining us online from a campground, I'm so sorry. But it uh, looks like it's going to be warmer uh, today. So enjoy the time out in uh, God's creation. One other thing I wanted to do is just take a moment and uh, congratulate all of those who have graduated from high school or college this past month. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Awesome. Way to go. Way to graduate through a pandemic. In all seriousness, I I am just blown away. I I had the privilege of walking alongside many of our uh, seniors in high school this past year and uh, just meeting with with some of them and uh, seeing the ways that that you guys have have just pursued Jesus this year. And uh, and in all honesty, I think our high school students have probably experienced the pandemic worse than most people. And uh, and we we as adults, myself included in this, have a lot to, to learn from you guys and just your adaptability this year and saying, hey, Jesus is still going to be my number one priority regardless of the difficult circumstances. And uh, it's just been amazing. I, I've met with some uh, seniors throughout this year and just ask them questions of, hey, how, how are you investing in others? And, and how are you being invested in by others? And, and how are you seeing God? And the, the answers have just been uh, amazing to hear. Students who are uh, reaching, uh, we've had seniors reaching out to underclassmen, meeting online for Bible studies to invest invest in, uh, in freshmen and sophomores. We've had students um, just talking to their uh, friends about Jesus and really using this pandemic as an opportunity to say, hey, our, our peers recognize the need for community, and so we want to show them uh, that community in Christ is, is uh, the solution to, to loneliness and to these things. And so uh, proud of, of those of you who have graduated and have just continued to seek Jesus. Keep doing that. Keep uh, putting him first in your life. Uh, We're going to jump into our message this morning. Uh, We're going to be in Luke chapter 18, uh, starting in in verse 9. We're uh, pretty far into our uh, series following the parables of Jesus. And so we've been looking at many of the parables of Jesus. We're not going to hit every single one. We're just looking at some of the messages that Jesus created. Parables are, are fictional stories that were used to, uh, to convey a deeper spiritual truth. And so Jesus told a lot of parables, and uh, there's so much depth, so much written, richness to his parables. So we're going to jump into one this morning that I'm really, uh, really excited about. So starting in verse 9, Jesus is going to be talking to, as he often does, he's sharing this parable with uh, the religious leaders, chief priests, Pharisees, and this is what he says. And Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Uh Uh-oh, there's a good start. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. So here we have this scene set. We've got two people. We've got one good person and one bad person. We've got one person who belongs at the temple and a second person who does not belong at the temple. And here they both are. You see, the, the Pharisee was, was the highest of the high. They were the religious leaders of the Jews, all Jewish people who were serious about their faith, who were serious about their identity as Jewish people. They wanted to be more like the religious leaders. They wanted to be like Pharisees. That was the goal, is I want to emulate the Pharisees because they are religious. They are doing the right things. These are the people who are in the temple each week. They're, I mean, they basically live and breathe the temple. It's their comfortable place. They believe belong there. But then you have, on the other hand, this tax collector. And we've talked about tax collectors before, but tax collectors during this time, they were despised by fellow Jews. You see, the tax collector, they were Jews themselves, but they willingly, they willingly became pawns of the Roman Empire, which the Roman Empire uh, came in and and conquered and, and ruled the Jewish people and treated them like dogs, and, and here you had these Jewish people who betrayed their own community to work for the people who enslaved them. 
and said, I'm going to make my money off of the, the sweat and tears of my fellow Jewish people and collect their taxes and take some of the money off the top. And so there are these people who are just blatant traitors of their own kind. And so they were, they were absolutely, as you can imagine, scorned by their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters. And so this tax collector, this, this is really important for us to, to get because this tax collector would have really stuck out in this temple. Because most tax collectors, they didn't hang out with a lot of Jewish leaders. I mean, they were hated by their Jewish brothers and sisters. So likely the only other Jews they were hanging out with was who? Other tax collectors. The other ones who were despised among their people. And so a lot of them spent most of their lives not even interacting with a lot of those Jews who took their religious duties as, as the Jewish nation of, of God seriously. And so it's likely that a lot of tax collectors didn't really have a, a very solid understanding of the Jewish religious uh, uh, customs and traditions of the time. You know, they, they may have had some because they lived around it, but there were a lot of things that they didn't properly know how they were ought to act as true godly religious Jews. And so here you have this tax collector who's now coming into the temple. And this is crazy because why would a tax collector ever go into the temple? They're not, they already know they're outside of the, the Jewish group. Why bother going to a place, a public place, where they're going to be seen by dozens and dozens of Jews who, who are likely going to glare at them like they always do, and go to a place where they're going to be condemned by the religious leaders, looked down upon by everyone? And I mean, if they're looked down by their fellow Jews, what is a holy, righteous God going to think of them if they try and come to the temple and be near his presence. And so this is pretty bold of this tax collector. Or maybe not. Maybe it's just, just foolish naivety that he's actually going through here thinking that he belongs when he doesn't. And he's going to stick out like a sore thumb. Let's look in verse 11 at what happens to both of them, what, what they do uh, when they come to visit the temple and spend time with God. It says in verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. We, we've perhaps been a little bit desensitized to the weight of this parable and how Jesus here is, would have received this intro to this parable because we look at this and we say, Wow, that Pharisee is pretty into himself. But at the time, it's likely that Jesus' hearers wouldn't have thought that. They would have thought, Hey, the this Pharisee's doing what he normally does, and that's a good thing. I mean, we can, even uh, with our modern lens, we can look at this and say, you know, a lot of the things that the Pharisee's talking about are good things. He, he says, um, he says quite, quite a few really uh, uh, insightful and, and righteous things that he's doing. He's separated himself from sinners in an effort to not be corrupted by bad company. He thanks God for his faithfulness from keeping him from a life marked by, uh, by sin. He's uh, not, uh, or he fasts twice a week, as was the custom for Pharisees. Usually on Mondays and Thursdays, they would fast from eating food. And uh, he would tithe, and, and Pharisees oftentimes would go above and beyond tithing. You know, normally it would just be 10% of your first fruits, but uh, some Pharisees, or a lot of Pharisees, often when they would get food from the marketplace, if they weren't sure if the merchant that they bought from was, uh, a, you know, a practicing Jew who would have tithed the food, they tithe the food just in case. So in some uh, circumstances, these, uh, these Pharisees were double tithing tithing over their food. I mean, so they were like going above and beyond. Here's the, here's the bar for what you're supposed to do, and they're like, we're going to take it a step further just to make sure we're over that bar. And, and that was the life of a Pharisee. A, a typical ph Pharisaical prayer, too. I mean, we see the, I'm certainly not that tax collector when he says that. We can see that there's pride in that. But, but again, for Jewish hearers, 
during this time, they, they think that that's normal because that was a, there was common prayers uh, among the Pharisees. A, a typical Pharisaical prayer, Pharisaical prayer went like this. I thank you, Jehovah my God, that you've assigned my lot with those who sit in the house of learning and not with those who sit at street corners. For I rise early and they rise early. But I rise early to study the words of the Torah and they rise early to attend to things of no importance. I weary myself, and they weary themselves. I weary myself and gain thereby, while they weary themselves without gaining anything. I run, and they run, but I run toward the life of the ages to come, while they run toward the pit of destruction. Like we said, the, the Pharisees, no one was shocked to see them in the temple. And in fact, I mean, he's, in that Pharisaical prayer, they're, they're reminding themselves of what they're running towards. They're saying, I'm running towards God. I'm trying to run towards religious, righteous things. I'm moving towards that. Whereas the tax collector, where's he running to? Useless stuff, worthless things. His own greed, his own ambition, trying to get money. Uh, it doesn't care who he hurts in the process, who he's taking the money from. He betrays his own people because all he cares about is money, which money, as, as we know, has, has no use in the age to come. We can't take it with us in the afterlife. And he's saying the, the, the tax collectors are wasting their time. They're pursuing nothingness. It's like having the most active deacon or Sunday school teacher or uh, elder versus a drug dealer or a crooked politician or an abortion clinic doctor. That's the dichotomy Jesus is trying to show us here. That's, that's what he's trying to set up. And he's not making an excuse for the tax collector. He's not trying to, to make us see the tax collector and go, what a poor victim of his situations, and we need to feel bad for the tax collector because of this and that. He's not saying any of that. In fact, he's not worried about their past actions. What Jesus is worried about in this parable is, is the content of their prayer and the attitude of their heart. So let's, let's break down the prayers a little bit. Just look at some of the differences. So the Pharisee, what does he do in his prayer? Did you, did you notice that he only mentions God once in his prayer? He says, I, me, myself, I, me, 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 me. I did this, I did that, I did that. He says, thanks God once, and then goes into this entire monologue about how I've done all of this. It's almost like he's just saying the prayer to remind himself of all the good things he's doing, as if to comfort himself and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm in good standing with God. Another thing he does, I, I love this, he, he compares himself, he tries to like puff himself up by comparing himself to the lowest of the low. He points at the tax collector, the one despised by everyone, the one that everyone knows is, is wicked in, in the way he lives. And he goes, I'm better than that. As if like setting such a low bar for himself is, is propelling him to the highest heights. It's like if you get a really bad test score, maybe your IQ is lower than you want, and you're like, well, at least I'm smarter than a fifth grader. And then you watch, are you smarter than a fifth grader? And you're like, at least I'm smarter than a second grader because, wow, they're smart. Right? It's like setting the bar so low that it's just stupid. I mean, it's like, okay, great. You're, you're better than the tax collector who betrayed everyone. Big whoop. That's not saying anything. The other thing he says is he says, I'm not a cheater. I'm not a sinner. I'm not an adulterer. And the sad, tragic part of this is he's, he couldn't be more wrong. You're, you're not a cheater. You're cheating God out of the credit that he deserves. You're cheating God out of the glory he deserves because all you're doing is spending the time giving yourself the glory. You're not a sinner. You've just spent this whole time using God to puff yourself up. You've gone to the temple to pray to God just to make sure that you can puff yourself up. Not an adulterer. I mean, surely this man idolizes himself, idolizes perfectionism and following the rules. Of course he's an adulterer. And then you have the tax collector's prayer. He just boldly comes broken before God, not to boast, but to humbly confess his sins. And, and there's the key right there is that humility that he brings forth. 
And humility, it's a word we've heard before, and sometimes it's easier to spot humility than it is to define humility, right? We can see someone and be like, that is a humble person, and there's just something about them that we can recognize it. One definition I I like of, of humility that's been proposed is that it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Meaning sometimes we have this false view of humility that if I just tear myself down constantly, if I just put myself down no matter what, even if I do something well, even if I have a gift that God's given me, I'm going to put myself down over and over and over again. That's true humility, and that's not. That, that's false humility. Because that's tearing down an image bearer of God. But true humility is just thinking of yourself less. It's thinking of how do I give God the glory in this situation? It's thinking of how do I reach other people with the love of Jesus? That's what true humility is. And of course, another way we can define humility is by saying what it is not. And and humility is, is, is not pride. Humility is the opposite of pride. Pride, I, I like the way St. Augustine has, um, has popularly um, uh, viewed pride. He says it's the root of all sin. It's at the root of every sin. See, see, pride is stripping God of his godhood and and trying to force fit that godhood onto ourselves. And and instead of saying there is creation and create or creation and creator, I want to be like God. In fact, the very first sin recorded, uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Satan deceives Adam and Eve and says, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will what? You will become God. You will become like God. You will become your own God. And, And pride is at the root of all of our hearts. When we sin against God, it's our pride saying No, 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 God. You are not in charge of me. I am in charge of me. I am the ultimate authority. I mean, we can be even. We can kind of share this throne here. But in reality, when you say something I don't like, I've got kind of a little bit higher on the the bar of, of authority. That's what pride is. It's It's a twisting of the created order. It's a distortion of it. And when we distort the way God has created the world, it destroys us. It harms us. Pride, it's trying to to creep into our hearts constantly. Now, for me, I've figured out this whole humility thing. I'm good to go. And so really, the main point for this message today is just be more like me. Um, Please don't be more like me. This world will be a mess. Um, But I joke about that, but in all seriousness, there's this reality to pride that even when we're truly humble, when we're living a life of humility, we can start to have this temptation to take pride in our humility. I love the way C.S. Lewis puts it. He he wrote a book called Screwtape Letters. It's a really fascinating book. And it's a book from a perspective. He writes from uh, a—obviously, it's fictional— but it's from a, a, an uncle demon. So he's like this elder demon in hell who's, you know, been running the show for a while, really expert demon. And he's writing a letter to his nephew demon who's kind of getting new into the game, like, okay, how do I ruin people's lives? And so the uncle's kind of advising his nephew in ways of how do you ruin uh, a human being's life? How do you uh, fulfill your purpose to, to deceive and, and, and accuse human beings? And this is what he says uh, in, the, in, in a chapter, in a letter about humility. He says, I see only one thing to do at the moment. Your patient, meaning the human being that this nephew is uh, currently trying to tempt, your patients become humble. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? See, all virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them. But this is especially true of humility. Catch him at the moment when he is really poor in spirit, when he's really humble, and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection. By joy, I'm being humble, and almost immediately pride. Pride at his own humility will appear. If he awakes to the danger and tries to smother this new form of pride, make him proud of his attempt, and so on through as many stages as you please. See, pride's this constant battle that we face each day, and sometimes even when we're truly living out humility, we start to go, hey, that was pretty good. And we're like, oh, 
darn it, I'm back at square one. I was just proud of my attempts to be humble. And it's just this constant battle, and it, it expresses itself in different ways, but it's common to all human beings. And the problem is not only does pride destroy us, it pulls us away from our mission as Christians to be the salt and light in a broken world. You see, if pride is trying to strip God of his godhood and force fit it onto us, then if I become God, then who cares about people in need around me? Who cares about other human beings? Because they're lesser beings. I am God, so I'm going to take care of myself above all else. That's the type of mentality that led the tax collector to be able to stand there before his creator God, his holy God, and look over and point at the tax collector who's clearly broken and distraught and at the end of his rope, who's clearly just uh, uh, totally, totally and utterly despairing his own situation. And he points there, and instead of going, how can I help that person? He uses him and sa- to, to propel his own ego and says, thanks for not making me like him. That's what pride does. It neglects our mission. It, it, it neglects our mission as Christians to, to follow Jesus in his command to make disciples of all nations. My wife and I, we've been watching through this show. It's called The Chosen. Many of you have probably heard of this. It's a, it's a, a show that's been out for a little over a year now. Um, they're coming, they've got the second season that's been going through right now. And it's just this uh, show about Jesus' life and ministry on earth. And I really like it. I mean, they fill in the gaps of a lot of places where we, like, the gospel doesn't. So, like, just interactions between the disciples and Jesus that we just don't see in God's word. And, And granted, we always have to take it for a grain of salt. We have to say, hey, you know, this isn't the Bible. This is a director imbuing his creative biases into this. But, um, but, but it's really fascinating. And some of the things, man, it's just, it just brings life to some of the disciples and, and some of the, the dialogue that they maybe had during their time and just walking alongside Jesus for three years. And there, there's, a, there's a disciple in God's Word in the Gospels named Matthew. He, he wrote one of the Gospels. And he's uh, known to be a tax collector before Jesus calls him to be his disciple. And I love in this show, The Chosen, they, they uh, try and portray some really difficult dynamics in the relationships between some of the disciples and Matthew. I mean, it's very likely that some, if not all, of these disciples had a hard time being okay getting along with Matthew, this man who's been betraying them, who's been taking resources from them. And so I wonder, I wonder if, if, as Jesus is saying this parable, if the disciples are listening in and starting to reflect on the way that they've been treating their fellow disciple, Matthew. And as I was thinking this through, I started to think, okay, well, how, how does this impact us in uh, the modern day right here today? And I started thinking about who needs to hear this message Right? I started to start, start to go, maybe, who do, who do I need to forward to that really needs to hear this? Because yikes, right? And, and that can be the temptation. But as I was doing that, and as I was just the thinking through, I just kind of felt that still small voice say, you do. You need to hear this message. And I, I, I spoke on humility to our students um, back several weeks ago, and I shared a story uh, of in high school, one of the, I think, one of the worst things I've ever said or done. Um, in high school, I, I was part of a church where I also went to school, and, uh, and I was part of their youth group as well. And so we would have youth group on Wednesday nights, and on Tuesday nights, there was another group of students that met. There was a really generous and uh, just, just some God-loving people who just wanted to see students come to know Jesus. So they would spend resources and spend just hours of their time each Tuesday night. They would take buses and vans and go pick up students from very broken neighborhoods. There was a local trailer park that was very run down, and uh, a lot of drug use amongst parents— a lot of just uh, abandonment 
for, for a lot of these students. So they go around and just pick up these students. I mean, these students would like have just fi- uh, finished a cigarette when they're like walking into the bus or they'd you know, just be yelling profanities as they'd be coming in. And so they'd bus them all in and they'd give them food because that's really what the, what the students were coming for. They're like, I just want warmth and food. And uh, they, would, they would talk to them about the gospel of Jesus. It was called New Beginnings. It was all about just reaching the lost student who would never belong in a church, who would never even feel comfortable in a church and bring him in. And uh, God bless him, my youth pastor said, one day he came to us in our youth group and said, hey guys, we're gonna try and change something up. We're still gonna have youth group on Wednesday nights, but we've kind of been having these two different events and we've had one on Tuesday night and one on Wednesday night. So what we're going to do is we're going to cancel that Tuesday night event. And instead, we're going to get all those people that are busing and taking vans. And we're going to have them pick them up on Wednesday night. They're going to come to youth group. Because how cool would it be since the majority of our students that were in our group had grown up in the church, knew a lot about God's word, knew a lot about what it means to follow Jesus. How cool would it be if you guys could help disciple these new students who, who maybe have never experienced Jesus or maybe are uh, just now learning what it means to follow Jesus. And I hate, I hate my response. My response was, how could he? How could he ruin our group and let these people infiltrate our group? And now they're probably gonna invite all their friends and now we're gonna have all these unchurched people spreading all this bad language and the whole room's going to smell like smoke now. And it's ridiculous when I look back at it, but I, I stopped going to youth group for the rest of the year. And I didn't come back until they were gone. And unfortunately, I wasn't the only one to do that either. The reality was, these high schoolers they came from, who came from broken homes and had sailors' mouths and smoked after service out on the church property, the reality is they understood the gospel more than I did. Me, a a kid who grew up in the church who knew all about the Bible, who memorized several books or several verses, I wish, um, several verses of the Bible, got pretty far in the Awana program, and they understood the gospel more than me because they understood what it meant to need Jesus to need the love and grace of their Savior. And I hadn't grasped that yet. And it wasn't until uh, a little while later as I served in a really underprivileged area in Hartford City, Indiana, which was just riddled with with a a meth epidemic at the time and a lot of brokenness. And and we saw a church of about 150 grow to, to 200 to 250 and saw over 50 people baptized in a year because people were just desperate for the gospel of Jesus. And y'all, our worship, I mean, our worship at the church at the time, I can say this now because they're a lot better, it was bad. Like, it was really bad. Like, offbeat and like, just the whole service was just poorly, (laughs) poorly executed each week. And I'm just sitting there like, oh my gosh, the gospel's ruined. But sure enough, Go figure, God was able to work through it because these people understood. I mean, we can appreciate amazing worship. Our our worship team does an awesome job at leading us each week. But the Holy Spirit's work is not conducive to our efforts. My wife was recently reading a book and it talked about uh, churches that become stale and and die out. And um, the number one indicator of that happening in a church is when people stop declaring the gospel to those around them. When the church body stops actively just talking about their faith, talking about the gospel in their interactions throughout the week, that is the number one indicator of a church becoming stale and eventually dying. Instead, those churches turn to internal quarrels about the style of worship, where we go to youth camp, what the color of the carpet should be, and all these things that just, at the end of the day, don't matter all that much. But why do they do that? Because they've stopped making it a priority to humble themselves and and learn this posture. You see, the fruit of the church is often dependent on on the church's ability to have corporate repentance of sin. 
and humble themselves. But what if our church, First Free Church, was filled with people who were broken? I mean, like, visibly broken. Like, where we didn't come to church to just learn something from the pastor's commentary set that we haven't heard before because we're just bored of hearing the same stories over and over again. But we came because we actually needed to hear the gospel each and every week, because we needed to be reminded of the love that Jesus has for us. We're coming out of a pandemic, and and I, I totally believe that God is preparing to use this church to impact his kingdom in massive ways. In fact, there already are several stories that I wish we had time to just share of of the way this church is impacting our community for Christ's kingdom. But it always starts with with this this concept here that Jesus is trying to teach. And and I don't know about you, but but I I don't want to come to church to just see people who have their lives together and know the Bible inside and out. I mean, I love those people. But I also want to see people coming into our doors who are visibly broken and declaring the needs in their lives and their need for Jesus. People who are struggling with sexual identity. People who are struggling with their attractions. People who are struggling on whether or not they should keep their baby. People who uh, have, have broken marriages and, and can wear that on their sleeve and just say, yes, I'm struggling in my marriage. People are saying, yes, I I lost my job and I don't know what to do and I'm struggling financially. And I'm not too proud to admit that. People who are lonely and just need in community. And I hope, I hope we're a church where those, that type of person comes into this building because they know they'll fit in with the rest of us. As broken Humans trying to be restored to our Creator. Too many churches in America are like the temple, where people who are wrestling with sin, living lives contrary to what God's Word says, they don't feel comfortable coming to church because they don't feel like they'd ever fit in. And I pray that First Free Church is not that type of church. And and if we are, or maybe some of us just live that way, how how can we change that? How can we uh, become a a church that that is more welcoming and and communicates Christ's love to those who need it perhaps the most? Well, we've already talked about it. It's through humility. Humbling ourselves into the position where it's no longer us versus them but just us, just human beings who struggle with sin. Now, now don't get me wrong, I I get it. I know that there's a difference between people who live in the world and and people who live in Christ. I I get that distinction. But the church should be the place where people can look to and say, here is a group of human beings just like me, lost, broken, hurting. But the difference is, and the only difference is, they have a Savior, Jesus, who fulfills them like no one else or nothing else can. That should be the distinction. I love the tax collector's response. It's one of humility and He didn't compare himself to others like the Pharisee did. He just, he actually came in spite of what people thought of him. Probably walked through crowds of people, potentially. I mean, the the temple was a very public place. A lot of activeness going on there. And and perhaps was spit at, was mocked, was jeered, and he didn't care. He went out of his way so he could come prostrate before God and confess his sins. I love that. Jesus, um, he finishes the parable by explaining God's response to the Pharisee and the tax collector. He says, I tell you this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
This parable is showing the recipients of Christ's justification. It's, it's not the man who prides himself in his efforts, but it's the man who realizes he is hopeless and helpless by his own merits to ever free himself from his sin. And that's the one who receives justification. The irony of this Pharisee is that in his efforts to earn his way into pleasing God, he becomes the stu- his own stumbling block to receive Christ's justification. He's the only one stopping himself from that invitation. There's a couple of parables that we won't go through in this series, uh, one in Luke 14 and the other in Matthew 22 that talk about some different banquets. And, and there's an, uh, uh, a host of these banquets that goes out and says, I want um, as many of my friends to be a part of this so we can celebrate, eat lots of food, and just have a great night together. And all of his friends are too busy thinking that their stuff is more important to do this. So he just goes out onto the streets and brings in strangers homeless people, and just is like, hey, come on in. Jesus is trying to say that too often these Pharisees, and too often some of us, we try so hard by our own effort to to somehow earn the satisfaction of God, to somehow earn his joy in us. He's saying, there's an open invitation to just accept my grace. And the very act of trying to do that is pride. We keep using this uh, term justified in here that this, this man walked a, a, a home justified. What, is, what does justification mean? Well, it's best understood in the context of the courtroom. And so uh, his hearers, Jesus' hearers, would have thought of this uh, in those terms as well. Being justified means, as a defendant is sitting there, uh, they're trying to show that what they did was right, or certainly at least that they didn't do wrong. And so if someone gets the verdict of not guilty, you've been justified, meaning you have done right as deemed by the jury. And Paul talks about this. Paul was a guy who hated Christians, made a living out of killing them. And then uh, on the way to kill more, he experienced uh, Jesus firsthand and gave his life over to Jesus, became one of the most prolific Christians of all time. He he wrote a letter um, to, to the church in Rome in Romans 3 talking about justification. He said, but now God has shown us a way to be made right, to be justified with him without keeping the requirements of the law. Meaning following rules isn't going to give anyone a leg up. It's not going to get you any closer to being justified. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right, we're justified with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. All have sinned. The, the, the Pharisee, the tax collector, the garbage man, the single mom, the convict, the pastor, the small group leader, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yet God, in verse 21, this is awesome. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right, justifies us in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right, justified with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right. He justifies sinners in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Justification, it's being made right in God's sight, not because of anything we've done, but but because of what Christ did on the cross by shedding his blood for us. In courtroom language, it's like every single one of us is seated as as a defendant And we know we're guilty. And and Satan, the accuser, is standing across from us. He's the the prosecution, and he's pointing out every single sin we've ever committed, every lie we've ever told, every thought we've ever thought, every secret sin that no one else has ever known about, all the things he's listing them out into public with a twinkle in his eye. And we know every single one of them is wrong. And the worst yet is We know that the judge is God, our creator, who knows all things, and so there's no point in trying to lie or cover it up. We're toast. And yet Jesus, what God's word says, Jesus stands before us as the verdict of guilty is coming out, as our sentence is coming upon us. He says, I will take that. And he dies for us 
So, so that now there is no more condemnation. There is no more wrath. If we've put our trust in Jesus, there's no sentence left. We are not guilty in, in God's eyes. God looks at us as he looks at Jesus, perfect, spotless, righteous, despite all the things we've done because of the love of Jesus. That's such a beautiful truth. And we all long to be justified, right? I, I mean, every single one of us, I, I, I do a terrible job at watching. My mom used to watch all these uh, crime shows and stuff. I don't understand it. You guys who like w listen to like murder podcasts and stuff, this is what's really sick. My mom will fall asleep. Sorry for calling you out, mom. My mom will fall asleep to listening to like crime mysteries of people being murdered. And I'm like, that is just messed up. And I, I know some of you guys watch this stuff, and it's interesting. I, I, I'll admit, I, get, I would get sucked in in high school. I'd walk past, she's watching some court case, and you just watch. Like, you, you know, you, you watch for a day, and you're like, okay, that guy's guilty. I mean, he's literally holding the bloodied knife in the courtroom. Like, you know that he's guilty of this, or whatever. You, you, just, you just are convinced. And yet, I know I do a terrible job being a part of the jury. Because whenever I'm watching these, I just, like, out of just this, I don't know. I just put myself into the defendant's shoes all the time. And I'm like, man, I know that they're guilty, but like, it still stinks to be in that position. Because no matter what, even if you know you've done wrong, you want to hear that not guilt. Nobody's like, guilty, 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 guilty. Oh, scotch free, darn it. Right? Like, we all long to be justified. But don't ever seek to earn that justification. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles themselves, or anyone who humbles themselves will be exalted. That's a promise from Jesus. That those parents who are at their wits end, feeling like failures as they watch their child walk away from their faith, the, the man on his knees in his basement, broken and crushed by an addiction to pornography, not sure how to get out. The, the woman crying alone on a bathroom floor after receiving an abortion. God, Jesus says, when those people cry out to me, they're justified. We all long to be justified, and Jesus says that by his grace, we're justified through, through a posture of humility. And so, what does humility look like? So I just want to close with three quick things we can learn from the tax collector here in pursuing a life of humility. Humility. The first, it says that he stood at a distance and dared not lift his eyes to heaven. First lesson we learn is posture. There's a great amount of research on, on the effects that posture, physical posture has on our psyche and our emotions. So I used to have a professor all the time that I would get kind of annoyed by. Like, it was just, I don't know why I got annoyed by it. But she'd talk about all the time, like, different postures that you do actually can affect your demeanor and your, uh, not only the way you present yourself to other people, but the way you actually feel. So, like, if you're um, putting your arms crossed, it, it can sometimes, uh, it's a comfort thing that we, that we give ourselves some comfort. I just saw some people like, I'm not across my arms, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it, it gives us comfort, but it's also a little bit of a protection, and so it, it gives us a little bit of a feeling of security, actually. Um, but it can also communicate to someone else that you're a little closed off. All right? So put the hand... No, I'm just kidding. Um, but there's different postures that we can do. And, and, and you know, you, you know it. If someone's listening intently to you, what are they doing? They're leaning forward. They're, they're looking right at you. And sometimes if you are struggling with listening or, or doing different tasks... Um, you can actually improve those by just changing your physical posture. Uh, how many of us, though, how many of us have ever used posture to, to um, impact our relationship with Jesus? How, more specifically, how many of us have ever just, have you ever kneeled in prayer to God? Have you ever just physically, like, got down on your knees and prayed? Because posture is important. Back, I mean, back in the Old Testament times, kneeling down was a way of, of showing a king or a god that you were before, that you're, you're uh, submissive to them, that, that they're above you. And so you're physically putting yourself down to say, you are above me, and I am subservient to whatever you want. And it's certainly not a command by God to kneel in prayer, but I think that there's value to our posture. Beyond just a physical posture, though, what's our 
heart posture. Have you ever exhibited a heart posture for wanting to be humbled? Because last week Adam talked about prayer and that there's like no magical recipe for how to get God to answer your prayers the way you want them. But, but I will say this. In my experience, there is one prayer that God just seems to like to answer more than any other, and it's to be humbled. Isn't that annoying? Right? Like, there's so many other prayers that I'd rather answer, and that one, it's like, there, there have been so many times in my life, I mean, there was a point where I, I can remember several examples of this, but there was a time where I was like, in the morning, just, God, humble me. And then as the words left my mouth, I'm like, mm, wait a second. I don't know if I wanted to say that. And for, like, seriously, like within an hour, first thing in the morning, turns out I make a huge mistake. I have someone come and talk to me, and they just belittle me in the conversation. They, they, they uh, use my age as, as, a we- as a weapon to like treat me as a child. And they do all this stuff, and they leave, and I'm just, I'm just livid. I'm just so angry, and I'm about, like, I'm kind of like, turn to God, and I'm like, God, smite them. And as I'm like trying to pray that, God's just like, hey, remember that prayer about an hour ago? I'm like, oh. and I literally just laughed, right? Like, I just laughed out loud of, oh my gosh, like, God totally will humble us. And as annoying and frustrating as it is, it's so important because it brings us closer to him and it puts us in our place as creation and not creator. Second uh, lesson we learned. Uh, he beats his chest in sorrow. We learned the, the important lesson of self-denial. Guys, I do a terrible job at, at this. I am so in my thing. I love planning my day out. I love making sure I know what I'm doing. I look at all my tasks. I'm like, okay, what am I going to get done today? I'm going to get this done in these hours, and I'm going to get this done, and then I'll leave some wiggle room here. And I just do that. And even at home, I'm like, okay, I'm in my thoughts. I'm doing this task, whatever. Da, da, da. And, and you can, like, my wife can attest to this. There are times where she, she, like, just asks me a simple question, and, like, I'm brought out of, like, what I've planned, and I'm, like, irritated that she just asked me, like, some like, hey, can you bring me a, like a bottle of water from, up, from like downstairs as I'm down there? I'm like, <laughs> I've got to walk an extra five steps now. But it's true. I mean, we, we do this all the time. I do this all the time. And there's just so many times where I'm in my routine and I'm doing good things, like productive things. And yet there's times where the Holy Spirit is tugging on my heart and saying, hey, go help that person. Hey, your neighbor's out in the backyard. Strike up a conversation. Talk about Jesus. Talk about your faith. Talk about church, whatever. Just go talk to them. And there's so many times where I convince myself that my plans are more important. Y'all, we need to be careful to raise our self-importance. I mean, the religious leaders, they stifled the spirit because they lived lives of self-importance and there's, there's no better way to, to choke out the spirit than, than to think that you're so much more important than what God has planned for you. Let's be careful that, that we don't try and quick reason to ourselves why our plans are better when the spirit's tugging on our hearts. Let's be careful in that moment where we're maybe passing a homeless person on the street and we're suddenly going to reason mode of why we shouldn't give them money or anything like that when God maybe is just tugging on your heart to say, human being alert, person made in the image of God, go talk to them and treat them as such. And we just completely miss out on a conversation. Or or times where God's just calling you to Get out of your, your routine that you're in the middle of and just help that person. Or maybe God's just saying, hey, here's an idol in your life. And instead of gripping it tighter, maybe let him have it. Following Jesus, and he's very clear about this, he says if we want to follow him, we've got to pick up our cross. What? Daily pick up a cross daily, deny ourselves daily, and follow him. That's the only way we can follow him to the fullest. Life will always be crazy and unpredictable. The other day, or yesterday, Abby and I were at the um, 
botanical gardens. If you've been there before, some of you have been there before, pretty awesome place, very beautiful, and uh, lots of greenery. If you don't like creation, you'll hate this place. Um, the, uh, we're walking around, and I kid you not, like, we're just going through, I mean, there's just wildlife everywhere, and uh, there's like this high grass, and all of a sudden, this little kitty cat just comes out out of nowhere and we're like what the this isn't the St. Louis Zoo and this cat just like walks up to me casually like hey what's up bro and just starts like rubbing up against me wants to be pet so I pet it a little bit and then I'm like holy cow there is a tag on this cat and so we look and there's a number on it there's a name of the cat we're like how are we the only people who have to have seen this we call the number and they're like we're like hey uh do you own this cat they're like yeah are you at the botanical gardens like they just sounded like oh like yeah they're like she just goes there. She'll be back. <laughs> and we're like, okay. And so we just moved on with our day. But that was just like a reminder that there's just, life is chaotic. There's just things that happen that we can never predict. And that's the way the world goes. And so if, if we can just deny ourselves each day, each morning when we wake up and say, God, not my will, but yours. Not my plans, but yours. Not my life, but yours then maybe we'll be a little more willing to change our plans when they inevitably get interrupted. Third thing, last thing we learn from the tax collector. He asks for mercy and confessed his sins. We learn the lessons of repentance. Maybe some of you this morning, you've you've never accepted the gospel. It's been there before, but you've, you've never fully accepted that there's a God who loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. And you're trying so hard to earn your way. You're trying to balance the scales somehow. But that's not how this works. Life isn't a a, a balance where you're trying to get more good than bad. It's a courtroom where you're already convicted and guilty. And the only way we can receive the forgiveness of our sins, the only way we can receive salvation is if it's given to us. And Christ says, there's an invitation open. You just have to put your trust in me. For others of you, maybe it's just that daily repentance, that daily asking for the forgiveness of sins. Because it's not like once this parable's done for this um, tax collector, it's not like, okay, did my whole kneel thing and cried, and now I'm good for life. I can guarantee you this tax collector came back to the temple again came back broken again. Because it wasn't like he went back home and everything was perfect. Got rid of all his idols, got rid of everything, and now he is living a sinless life. I mean, I'm sure there are habits that took a long time to break. I'm sure he was still a tax collector for a long time after that. Until God revealed the need to get rid of that too. Or or maybe do it in a godly way at least. We need as Christians to keep humbling ourselves before God, asking for the forgiveness of our sins, realizing that we're never going to be perfect this side of heaven, and that's okay, but can we be broken by our sins? I I want to pray um, this morning, and I'm just going to ask something of you, and and it's totally up to you if you want to do it or not, but would you kneel with me in prayer? If you have physical limitations, I I totally get that, but can we just practice that, that um, modeling posture in our prayer, modeling humility in our posture as we pray. Let's, uh, let's pray together, and, and if you're able, would you just kneel with me uh, before our God and humble ourselves before him? God, <clears throat> we thank you for, for your love. We thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you for giving us the ultimate example of humility in living a life in a human body, experiencing pain and being nailed to a cross, spit on, mocked, and hated by the people you created and the people you came to save. Jesus, would you humble us? Would you help us to, if there's any sin in our lives, forgive us of those and let us have a contrite and broken spirit over our sins and desire your grace and your forgiveness. God, will we uh, deny ourselves each and every day, each and every morning? Will we uh, uh, just be all about your mission, your plans, your will? And God, would you use this church 
to impact the community for your kingdom, God. May we see lives transformed by your gospel. God, may we see, um, as we go out into the community, may we begin to see more people just coming to us because they want to be a part of something more, because they see that you alone can fulfill them. Jesus, we thank you for all that you've given us. We pray for your blessing on our day. It's in your name we pray. Amen.